You're listening to The Robin and Boom Show, engaging the contemporary world with the great tradition. Find us on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, or on our website at robinmarkphillips.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, here's today's co-host, Robin Phillips. Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. We've got an exciting show for you. Hello, Jason, how are you? Okay, Robin, how are you? Oh, I'm doing very well. You know, this year has been off to a tumultuous start for Americans. The controversy over the border wall led to the longest shutdown in government history. And now President Trump is attempting to use his executive power to declare a national emergency as a way of securing the funding he needs for the border wall. And just yesterday, we learned that the Senate voted to block the president's emergency declaration. And while this has been going on, the rhetoric about impeachment has been gaining momentum as the House Judiciary Committee investigates the possibility that the president may have been involved in obstruction of justice. So there's a lot of craziness going on right now. Jason, what do you think about all of this from your perspective overseas? Because you are you are an American, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Born and raised. American is Johnny Cash and apple pie. Okay, but uh, yeah, you've chosen to be an expat. Yeah, I'm abroad in Europe, teaching at a international school in one of the more up-and-coming countries in Europe, Estonia, which got its freedom from the Soviet Union back in the early 90s, is fully integrated into the West, NATO. And by the way, in Estonia, we pay our fair share. We pay our 2% or more of GDP for NATO. So, President Trump, if you're listening to this podcast, I hope you are. Estonia, we're doing our bit. Anyway, yeah, so I'm abroad in Europe, and what I found is that you can never leave America. America is the dominant country in the world. Wherever you go, America is going to be there in some way. doesn't matter how big the Chinese economy is going, getting to be, America still dominates the world in many ways that I think a lot of Americans don't realize, certainly in Europe. In Europe, America is a continuous presence, and Europeans pay very close attention to American politics. It's unbelievable. I'd say that many Europeans follow American politics more closely than Americans do. So during 2016 with the primaries, our Stones come up and ask me, oh, what's going on with Iowa? What's going on with the New Hampshire primary? And while you, Robin, you've been talking about the border wall, we've just had some big political news here in Estonia. In Estonia, you might call the Estonian version of Trump, the Ekre party, Estonian conservative populist party, is now in the position to become a member of the coalition of the government, breaking a taboo against a Trump-like party in Estonia. And just as in America, there's a lot of controversy over immigration and the border, there's a lot of controversy about that over in Estonia. If anything, I'd say that immigration and perhaps even border issues, the number one issue in Estonia. So it's people definitely paying attention to America. And then as an expat, with all of the communications, if I want to, I can follow exactly everything that's going on in America, often real time. Social media, news, even television programs, music. Sometimes I don't want to. Sometimes I want to focus on my studies or my teaching. Lent has just started for Orthodox Christians, so I want to pay less attention to the news cycle now. But as I said, you can't escape America, and when I want to, I can follow exactly everything that's going on. So I don't feel any any remove. Interesting. So I didn't know that about the way Estonian politics so closely mirrors some of the dynamics going on in America right now. And is that a 
a pan-European thing? Are, are we seeing, uh, or, or perhaps perhaps a global phenomenon? There's certainly been a convergence between European and American politics over the past five to ten years. It used to be European and American politics worked in very different cycles, with the exception of Britain. Britain has always been the more American style. Well, British will hate me saying that. Um, there's a love-hate relationship between Britain and America, but it's it's a special relationship. Special relationship with the scare quotes, with the fingers. Yeah. Okay. Well, in terms of politics, with Thatcher and Reagan, British and American politics became really convergent. And Americans have followed what's going on with Britain because of the language, ease of language access. Europe, however, followed a very different pattern. For example, conservatives in Europe often are more comfortable with higher levels of government intervention. And the left there will just openly call themselves socialist. That didn't happen in America until Bernie Sanders broke the taboo against calling oneself a socialist. Yeah, it's... In the past few years, if anything, Americans have started to imitate Europe. Because before Trump, there were plenty of populist, nationalist parties in Europe. Not fascist. That's kind of a slur people like to try to use. Well, there are some nationalist parties in Europe that I'd say are are fascist or post-fascist. But there are plenty of nationalist parties that are really more like a kind of classical liberalism or trying to go back to a nation state type of nationalism and trump's emergence is very much like that he's the first european style populist politician to appear in america and surprisingly he won so it's not so much that europe is echoing america as the trump phenomenon is echoing currents that have been in europe for some time now is that what I take you as saying? Yes, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So there's actually been a little bit of back and forth. In Europe, as I mentioned, conservatives traditionally have been more skeptical about the free market than in America. With Reagan, conservatives in Europe started embracing more free enterprise parties, policies. So there was an American influence on European politics. But now we're starting to see the Republican Party moving away from an uncritical admiration of the free market. And this emphasis on using protectionism, tariffs, make America great again through government support for manufacturing. These are traditional European policies. Interesting, interesting. So if we look from the perspective of social psychology at some of the undercurrents that are animating American political discourse at the moment, it seems clear that there is an increasing tribalism as well as increasing sense in which political relationships, both, both between individuals and between parties and between the different branches of government, um, in which these political relationships are becoming purely transactional as a zero-sum competition between winners and losers. And in this zero-sum state of affairs, questions of truth tend to collapse into questions about rights, and questions about rights tend to collapse into questions of power, and in particular, the competition for power among warring ideological groups. So it becomes very, very difficult to make appeals to the common good or to any objective framework that can adjudicate between the claims of, of these different tribes. So political discourse in the United States is in some sense spiraling into increased polarization, um, not so much in the sense of extreme, people going to the extremes, although we're seeing that too, but polarization in the sense that people, parties, and groups um, simply talk past each other without any common ground, um, without any common reference point to be able to dialogue intelligently, um, intelligibly, I should say. So is, is this something we're seeing in the European context as well? Yes and no. In both America and Europe, the center is breaking down. The traditional way of having consensus, compromise politics in both regions, 
American Europe is falling apart. So within the continent, the center-left party is the equivalent of the American Democratic Party. They have been losing lots and lots of voters, really hemorrhaging. But also the center-right parties, equivalent of the Republican Party, have been going through their own crises. So in Germany, Merkel's Christian Democrats are getting a lot of trouble and pressure from Alternative for Germany, which is a pretty nationalist political party now. It is becoming increasingly nationalist. And it's really challenging the identity, the policies of Germany's equivalent of the Republican Party, the Christian Democrats. I don't think there's quite the level of bitterness, polarization, tribal fighting in Europe that you find in America, although I see it happening more so in Britain. But you know, on the other hand, maybe it's just a lot of this polarization has already been here in Europe for a while. Antifa was originally a European phenomenon, after all. It's just that the consensus politics, the political center that's been holding things together in Europe has broken down, and a similar things happening in America. For those of you who are just tuning in, I'm Robin Phillips, and I'm talking with Jason Van Boom. We are talking about politics in America, in Europe, comparing the two. This is a listener-supported broadcast, and we hope you will stay with us because we have the quote of the week coming up. But before we get into the quote of the week, I wanted to just ask you an, another question, Jason. What are are some of the philosophical and cultural <coughs> correlates to these developments that we're seeing in, in America, uh, where a lot of commentators have, have been saying that we are, we are seeing the outworking of the state of affairs that Alistair McIntyre described in the first chapter of After Virtue, where there is no longer, even in principle, um, any way to return to a shared discourse that can left, lift us out of pure tribalism. Is, are the commentators who say that exaggerating? Uh, wh what's going on here as we look into the future and, and try to have a responsible Christian philosophical approach to the current political climate? That's a good question. It's basically, I would agree with those commentators. I also share the support for a restoration of virtue ethics in philosophy. I do believe that in the long run, a society cannot cohere unless there is a strong commitment to the common good. Philosophically, an idea of a common good cannot be sustained unless there's some sense of human nature and an end or purpose, some kind of what philosophers call teleology or final cause. But, you know, things are not inevitable. I think that within liberalism, and I'm here meaning in the philosophical sense of ranging from classical liberalism to, say, the liberalism of Barack Obama, just emphasis on rights, there's always a tension there. There's the capacity to collapse into atomization of society, because all of the emphasis on individualism, on rights, not emphasizing a common good, not emphasizing objective moral norms, secularization of the state and of all society, beyond, you know, it's possible to have a secular state and a religious society, like the United States had for most of its history. You know, pushing that further, all of those trends have a capacity towards reducing society to a bunch of isolated individuals. And we don't take isolation well. Extreme individualism leads to angry and bitter individuals. What has prevented that has been a counter thing of narratives or stories about national identity, national belonging. So, for example, in America, it wasn't just simply all John Locke. We had stories about the Pilgrims and the Puritans and Christopher Columbus, Founding Fathers, Cowboys, opening of the American West. 
all these cultural elements creating a narrative with a shared sense of history, a shared sense of destiny, help to bring people together. So for a while, despite the capacity for political classical liberalism to devolve into atomism, we were able to keep together with this common national narrative. There were some problems with that. There were a lot of problems in American history, such as slavery, the treatment of Native Americans, treatment of industrial workers, and so forth, which this narrative tended to gloss over. So some kind of criticism was necessary. But what we've gone into an extreme in which there's no longer a national narrative, there's no longer a national story to hold Americans together. Europe is also feeling some of this, and I think this is part of the appeal for the various shades of nationalist parties in Europe. People do not want to become isolated individuals. So where are the roots? Where is the common home? Okay, so with regard to the collapse of common national narratives, I'm wondering if it's inevitable that as as the narratives that give us cohesion collapse, that other symbols, myths, and metanarratives will rush into to fill the vacuum? And if so, what would you identify as some substitute myths, symbols, and narratives that are, are coming to animate American culture in the absence of these older points of cohesion? Yes, you'd think there'd be something to fill a void, but I don't see anything really quite filling the void right now. I'd say it's a kind of entrepreneurial moment, be analogy with economic entrepreneurialism. There's a need, a big need. People have a need for cohesion, for community, for narrative, for identity. This need is not being met. So there's a lot of attempts to try to meet that need. There are a lot of different swirling currents, different types of symbols and meta narratives that people are offering, trial balloons sometimes. And part of the chaos in our time is that we don't have anything yet to fill that void and people can't agree on what there will be. I do think that there's a tendency towards an identitarianism on the right and an identitarianism on the left. Now, immediately when saying this, people will say, oh, you're making a false equivalence. I'm not attempting to say that there's moral identity, simply parallel phenomena of focusing on identity and the kind of tribal politics playing out in different ways on the left and right sides of the spectrum. Uh, do we do we see perhaps the the cl- collapse of our meta narratives into a s- splintering of micro narratives that um, range everywhere from tribal identity to to sports? I mean sports get uh, sports and popular music uh, give amazing cohesion to um, certain segments of society in a way that, uh, and I guess uh, baseball has been like that for a long time in American society, but are, are, are we seeing a migration of the symbolic to, to purely uh, imminent expressions? By imminent expressions, you mean things such as sports, fashion, music? E- exactly. Right. Well, We've always had that. It's the question is about its stability. So, like you mentioned about baseball teams in Amer- in Europe, that's often fulfilled by soccer teams or European football. Sports have actually become much more important with the industrial revolution, the rise of mass cities as people leave the villages and towns because of that need for cohesion. And actually, what you mentioned about that, it brings up the time when. When I was in the, the San Francisco Bay Area, see, it was the Giants who had won the World Series. And the whole city came together. Everyone was wearing the colors of the baseball team, the jerseys. It was like this identity of the baseball team had supplanted everything else for, for one day. And there was this general sense of euphoria, kind of 
mystic you know, uplift. I don't particularly follow sports. I'm actually, <laughs> I don't even remember if I got the name of the San Francisco baseball team correct. I'll probably be crucified for this. Yeah, that's correct. They're, they're the Giants. They're the Giants. Okay, good, good, good. I actually, I, in my defense, I prefer college football. All right, so I'm a big Buckeyes fan. But in any case, even I, someone who's not, you know, super big into baseball, was got kind of into that spirit. It was a good thing to see. I think what happens is that what you call this imminent symbolism, that's just the, the symbols that people can immediately relate to. They're not necessarily very philosophical or theological things, such as music and sports. When you do have deeper philosophical commitments underlying them, then that whole structure can work very well. We don't have these deeper underlying commitments anymore. And we're seeing actually a fracturing. So, for example, football has become extraordinarily politicized and divisive during the Trump administration, maybe starting before then, too. So there's no point, no area in American culture in which we can say that the majority of Americans are able to come together and forget their political differences. Interesting, interesting. Well, I want to uh, pause for a minute to give the quote of the week. This is from C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man. He says, There has never been and never will be a radically new judgment of value in the history of the world. And then a little bit later, he writes, The human mind has no more power of inventing a new value than of imagining a new primary color, or indeed of creating a new sun and a new sky for it to move in. <clears throat> that C.S. Lewis from The Abolition of Man. And that actually relates to something else I wanted to ask you about, returning to your comment about teleology and virtue ethics. Uh, it seems to me, and I don't know if this is correct, I'd like to get your feedback on this, but it seems like in a sense, in America today, we are trying to do the impossible, which is to um, to have a functional political philosophy without a natural philosophy. So the questions that... Bingo. Yes, yes. So, so the questions that natural philosophy addresses would be things like... What are the goods appropriate to human nature? What is human flourishing? What means lead to the end of human flourishing? Or given the nature of the human animal, what is the optimal relation between the individual and the collective? These are all basic questions of philosophy that, uh, that precede political philosophy, even a purely operational and functional political philosophy. And it seems like the different, uh, whether you're right, whether you're left, whether you're Republican, whether you're Democrat, whether you're socialist, we seem to be doing the impossible, which is trying to build various operational political philosophies without reference to these deeper teleological questions. Um, is that an exaggeration of, of what's, what's happening now in contemporary political discourse? I agree with you, Robin, but let me act as a devil's advocate. An objection to what you've said is the vast majority of people are not philosophers. They don't care about philosophy. It's not relevant to them. They don't read philosophers such as David Hume or Bertrand Russell. So what's the point? Who cares whether philosophers have their act together or if society is able to agree on a plausible natural philosophy? Why does it matter if most people are not philosophers? I wonder, though, when, when we abandon the attempt to, be, to construct explicit, direct philosophy, whether we then become victim to functional uh, philosophical presuppositions without without realizing it whether 
whether there's an operational philosophy that seeps into the nooks and crannies of how of what we assume to be the case and how we behave without being critically examined. Yes, I think that's actually the adjective to use, one of them, functional. So society functions on the basis of certain philosophical ideas, even if most people are not explicitly aware of them. So on you know, on the one hand, philosophers' ideas, they get filtered down all sorts of ways. Because we have journalists, artists, filmmakers, teachers, lawyers, they study philosophy or come close to studying philosophy in, in colleges and university, and they're often the middle people, the connecting links between what's going on in the highest levels of ideas and contemporary culture. We see this, for example, with critical race theory. Some theoreticians in the sev- starting in the 70s really start developing these ideas. And now, today, we have people talking about, say, whiteness, white privilege all the time. There was a certain mediation happening before that. You know, and so speaking of that, you know, people on the left, progressives, often talk about distinction between systemic racism and personal racism. You know, some a person might not individually have any particular racist ideas or racist consciousness, but in terms of how they're acting and how society institutions are acting are having a racist effect. I'd say that the West is suffering from a kind of institutional nihilism. Even if people are not personally nihilistic, even if they do not explicitly hold to nihilistic premises or principles, the functioning of society is based upon fundamental nihilistic ideas, such as the denial of a common human nature or the denial of an objective transcendental good to which all societies in some way either gravitate towards or fall away from and perish. Would uh, nominalism uh, also be a philosophical framework that operates on this uh, functional level? Um, and uh, Maybe you could define nominalism in the philosophical sense for our listeners. You know, Robin, you've actually done more academic scholarly work on, on nominalism than, than I have, but uh, you know, I do teach about history of ideas. So I would say that what nominalism is about is this. In everyday life, we have terms that refer to important ideas. We use words such as truth, justice, beauty, order, freedom, equality. These fundamental ideas are used to evaluate things. So when we make a judgment about something, about being better or worse, in some way we're using these fundamental ideas. The question is, what's the reality of these ideas? So Plato would say that these words refer to spiritual realities, real principles, real causes that operate behind the scenes of the phenomenal world. Aristotle would say that these words refer to ideas as present in things, that essences, attributes, forms, as embodied in the physical world we encounter. So many different ways can go with that. Both Platonists and Aristotelians will say that there's some kind of reality to which words such as truth, beauty, and justice refer to. Nominalism says these words are empty. They are hollow. They are nothing but words. There's only the phenomenal world. There are only phenomena. There's only the play of sight and sound and smell and taste. And we create these generalities, signifying them by words, but that's all they are. They are purely subjective constructs. No more solid than the breath we use to sound these words. It, it reminds me of the way in our contemporary world, uh, people are increasingly being sus- 
they're increasingly suspicious of of abstract truth and values um, within the world in which um, all epistemology has migrated to the to the imminent. Um, is that is that a fair observation that that the functional nominalism of our society is animated by um, an inability to conceive um, uh, abstract truth and values that go be the values that are in any way rooted in transcendent order? I'd say so. And I'd say as an example of the functionality of that is to be successful, we're encouraged not to think in the abstract. We're encouraged to react. We see that now as social media with hot takes. The news cycle is being compressed into hours or minutes or even seconds. We encourage to react immediately. And people often take emotional fervor as a sign or a substitute for real certainty. But then also just leisure is the basis of culture, as Joseph Pieper said. When people are running around all the time and we don't have quiet spaces or quiet times anymore, there's nothing like a Sabbath of, okay, we're taking some time away from things. You have to be in your phone constantly because work goes outside the workplace. We're constantly on call to our businesses or to our employers. And, oh, here's an emergency that's come up. Hey, it's 7 p.m., but you better attend to this. You better go to this file on Stack or on Gmail and click, 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 tapity, tapity, tap on the phone. You've got to react very quickly to these images being displayed against the digital screens because the profits of the company and your career depend upon them. We are like frantic mice, continually being moved around by ceaseless stimuli. Mice who are continuously stimulated will never come up with an abstract thought. And actually, there, there is a, a growing body of neurological research that supports that. And I look forward to sharing that on future editions of this show. Well, thank you, Jason. I think it's been a very, for me, it's been a very stimulating conversation. And I hope the same is true of our listeners. Thank you, Robin. It's been a great pleasure. And join us next week as Jason and I continue the great conversation. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. The Robin and Boom Show is made possible through the generous support of listeners like you. To become a patron of the show, go to robinmarkphillips.com and select The Robin Boom Show from the drop-down menu. If you have questions you'd like to have addressed on a future episode, send us a message through our Facebook page. Once again, thanks for listening.